should wait for a couple minutes. Are there any questions? Homer questions? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's all right. Okay, that was here for Albert. Uh, Al. Yeah. Okay, Al. Um, notice I had to switch one of my X to a K. <laughs> one instance of the, ne of the negative binomial random variable. In general, we'll consider the waiting time until the rth head appears. So, the, this will actually be, a, this 2 here would be a parameter of the negative binomial distribution. The p would be the other parameter. Okay. Now, how would you calculate the frequency function of x? Frequency function would be p of k, equals the probability that x equals k. Let's just take it this parameter where we're looking for the second, wait until the second half appears. It's the number of tosses, I'm still including the tosses, and it gives you the second head. Well, how, how would you think about Give me an example. Um, so what's, what, what would be uh, P of 3? What, what kind of events would I throw in to calculate? I'm just going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to decompose <coughs> this event, the event that x equals to 3. Actually equals to 3. That means I have to get ahead on the third toss. And it has to be the second head, exactly the second head that appeared. So I could decompose that event, x equals 3, right? And how would I, how would I get that? So that would be, I would get, uh, let's say, I could get heads on the first toss, then I'd have to get tails on the second toss and heads on the third toss. Or, 
Um, I can get, uh, is there any way I can get heads on the first sauce for that? No. Uh, is there any other way I can do heads on the first sauce? No. Because I'd have to get, I can't put heads on the second sauce because then X would be two. Now I put tails on the first sauce, though, tails, and then of course I have to get heads on the second sauce and heads on the third sauce. So there's only two, so to speak, elementary events that would contribute uh, to the decomposition of the event X equals 3. That exhausts all the possibilities in terms of heads and tails, sequences of heads and tails. So the index here, 1, 2, 3, just means this corresponds to the number of the toss. Heads on the first toss, tails on the second toss, heads on the third toss. Is everybody following? So you see that the heads has to come last in the sequence. So this is simply uh, two times, uh, well actually each of these probabilities is the same, is it not? Because two heads and one tail, so it's two factors, there's two factors of one minus, excuse me, two factors of P. Exactly k minus one. Uh, so I'm looking for exactly. I said it wrong. I'm looking for exactly one head in the first k minus one tosses. You can. You can't really handle blue, can it? Exactly. One head in the first k minus one. I need the probability of that. Well, I think it's the number of ways of doing that. That's how many terms I have here. The number of terms in union. Exactly. Uh, is the number of ways of getting exactly one hit the first game minus one thousand. Is the number of ways of obtaining. This is going to be hard to read. Exactly one head in the first k minus one tosses. Comments about that or questions about it? All right, so how many ways is that? I'm choosing one thing, one place for heads. And k minus one places, so this k minus one choose one ways of doing that. So that's how many how many things we have in the union here. Here I had uh, three choose one. Two, excuse me, three minus one choose one. Two choose one. So three minus one choose one equals two choose one. That's how many terms that were there. Two terms. I'm saying in general for the case of looking for the. Uh, for in the case of the waiting time until the second head appears, then uh, I'll have a union of k minus 1. Choose 1, which is just k minus 1. And all, each of the 
each. It says before each of these terms has the same exact probability. There are two heads, and k minus two tails, because there are k tosses. So then I'm going to get uh, p of k equals one minus p to k minus two times p squared, and then times this. I'll just put it k minus one, choose one. All right. So now can we handle the the general case of the binomial? Negative binomial. Is this what I have written down? Um, I have written down uh, another frequency function on page five of these notes. And that's the case, the general case. So the general case uh, x equals the waiting time. Tell the heart arc head appears. And of course, here k had to be greater than or equal to 2. Because I have to take at least two tosses to get to the second head. So the actual range of the random variable will depend on this parameter. R. So it's not just going to be k equals 1, 2, 3, it's going to be k equals 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. When I'm, looking, when I'm waiting until the second head appears, I'm waiting until the r head appears, and I'm going to have k equals r, r plus 1, and so on. And the p of k, you're going to work it out the same way. You're going to say, okay, the last flip has to be a head. Now the previous k minus 1 uh, flips. It can be anything subject to condition that has to be exactly r minus 1 heads in them. So I'm looking at filling r minus 1 heads and k minus 1 slots. There's k minus 1, choose r minus 1 ways to do that. And then I'm going to have my, I'm going to have how many heads and how many, I'm going to have, by definition, I'm going to have r heads totally. I'm going to count the last. Term of the sequence too. I think that probably each of these k log sequences. And then I'll have uh, one minus p to be k minus r here. K minus r tails. So this is k equals r r plus one, and so on. <coughs> and so then I've written down another uh, a generalization of the geometric summation formula by saying that these probabilities sum to one. Generalization to geometric summation formula. I think I'll neglect to write that down since it's in the notes already. The assertion is if I sum this from k equals r to infinity, I get 1. If I take the case r equal to 1, that just gives you the geometric summation formula. The geometric random variable in this case, r equals to 1. r equals to 1 means this will be, r minus 1 will be 0. Anything to 0 is simply 1. So this coefficient turns into 1 when r is equal to 1. Okay. Let's see if you get the generalization. That's the common part of the geometric random variable. We're going to have some kind of counting argument to make one of your homework problems easier. And that is the homework problem <coughs> number 15 in chapter 2. If you don't have your text yet, you might want to jot down what the problem is as I read it. And I can hand my text around so you can look at it if you want to. Just have something to chew on. Why? <laughs> you don't have a book. It doesn't mean you can't think about problems. Okay. Two teams, A and B, play a series of games. That's a test. That's a <laughs> <laughs> that was like a test for some computer science courses? No. Or that's for the uh, engineering probability statistics. Oh, really? Yeah. You just took the uh, test, huh? Well, no. no. That was 
Okay, here it is. All right, well, let's get into the problem. Let's get the If team A has probability 0.4 of winning each game, is it to the advantage, is it to A's advantage to play the best three out of five games or the best four out of seven? Assume the outcomes of the successful games are well, the answer is the obvious. Play, perhaps. The more you lose. Right. The longer the, the series, the, the yeah. less likely it is for A to yeah. win. That's obvious. But now you actually want to uh, show the probabilities, show how much advantage it is to play the 3 out of 5. So I actually want yeah, to find you calculate the probabilities. So, yeah, I did with the final. Um, let's take it with a fresh mind. Okay. <laughs> uh, there are um, some uh, combinatorial arguments, but uh, well, how would you think about the event that A wins? So you just simply have two teams. And so uh, A and B play a best three of five series of games. How could I denote the event that A wins? Well, A wins in the first three, A wins in the first four. A wins, okay, would be, in terms of, I need to invent some notation. Well, your case on We just put A for A wins and B for B wins, right? Instead of success and failure, so just do A, so A1 is A win, A wins first game. B1, B1, B1 wins the first game. So B1 equals B1 wins the first game. And obviously B1 equals A1 complement. So the A could just win all three, right? Right after that. That's one way. Okay. Uh, what else has to happen? What's, what's true here? There's only one way to do that. There's only one way to do that anymore. Yeah. That's only one way to you just win the first three games. There's only one way to do yeah. it. There's only one elementary event. So it's like heads and tails. This is exactly heads and tails type analysis. So um, that you could work it out using negative binomial variable. Yeah. Okay? You can work out using negative. So then you can have A1, A2, B3, A3, for example, etc. Or blah, 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 blah. But again, if A wins, I mean, he has to win the last game. You can't. The best, is, best three. If A is going to win, it has to win the last game. So exactly as in this negative binomial derivation. So I think it was worthwhile going to the negative binomial derivation. You can go through it again here if you like. You can go through long again. So, so this would be, uh, so you can set it up. You're waiting for the third head. Right? You can say A wins corresponds to heads. And A wins on the ninth game corresponds to heads on the ninth toss. So the, this is the probability that, it, uh, that I get my, my Third head first on the third toss. Okay. Third head first on the uh, fourth toss. Or the third head first on the fifth toss. I can't go anymore. Okay. I'm only looking for the, the event that I'm getting my third head first on either the third, uh, by the third, fourth, or fifth toss. So I'm looking at a P, a P of three plus P of four plus P of five. Set it up that way. 
I don't know. Okay. Just get some numbers. I want to see the probability to come up. <laughs> okay. I'm not playing with the answers. The answer book, the book does have some answers in the back. Is everybody aware of that? I think some of the uh, odd number problems, for example, are answered, and I don't distinguish between odd and even that much when I'm assigning problems. I'll just give you a little printing of each, but um, so I'll give you some answers in the back, but if it's just a short answer, like the answer, obviously three out of five is better for A. Uh, that's not sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> I need to see the word. I need to see actual probabilities. And I want to, right, in, this, in this example, if it was on a test, uh, like that one you took, <laughs> maybe that would be enough to answer the matter. Right, at least give that much. Yeah. Right, at least give what? Make you write that probability. Yeah. No proof. One other thing I want to do from notes one is to pass on that verbal. Any questions at this point? I was trying to sketch a hint on how to do this problem number 15 from chapter two. How you can do it using binomial, a negative binomial distribution. Poisson distribution. Does this bold color bug, bug you? I mean, is this a toxicity level too high? For I'll try to get some on the pen for today. I think we're going to be stuck. Um, so the Poisson, let's try a better kind of that. As long as it's going to stop. probability of heads on each toss, uh, then what, what x is the total number of heads? It's not the waiting time as in the geometric for negative binomial. This is going to confusing that negative binomial name. But it's the um, total number of heads in the end tosses of a biased coin. Probability of t for the coin. For heads for the coin. Then what we can do is we can talk about the mean at the average the average number of heads. You see, when you toss a hundred coins, the probability of, let's say one half of the heads, just take a very simple case, n equals a hundred, n equals a half, then you expect fifty heads. But what do you mean expect? Who would, who would try to illustrate what I mean by the expected number of heads is expected? It seems more likely than any other event. Okay, that's one way to do it. Over a long period of trials like that, it would average out or converge on 50. Yeah, what would you, yeah, that's the actually official meaning of expected in terms of probability. Uh, 
though, is, though in this context also you expect 50 head. That's the highest. Uh, we actually calculate the frequency function of x, the little p of k. And p of 50 is the biggest, uh, has the biggest value of all the p of k's. <laughs> okay. So that is true. That among all the possibilities, it's, um, the 50 heads will occur most often. However, the official mean of expected value is that if I take these 100 coins and I toss them and I get 48 heads, then I toss them again and I get 53, and I toss them again and again and I get more and more numbers, and I average all those numbers, and the average of those numbers is 50 to limit. So that's the number I expect after repeated experiments and averaging. I expect that to be the outcome of the average. So sometimes instead of the expected value, we talk about average value because it has, carries a little bit more immediate meaning. <clears throat> All right, so the average, the expected value, or average value, is NP equals, okay, it's NP, right? just the number of tosses times the probability of heads. Right? And what's the variance? Something that you had in the first course, the variance, and we're not going to discuss in this course until a couple chapters down. Okay, it seems crazy, but when we do cover variance, we're going to cover it in more depth and maybe not spend so much time on it. NP1 minus P. So for a binomial variable, the average value is NP, and the variance is NP1 minus P. Now what can we do? We can, uh, <coughs> this was the example, thought example. Right. The ending was 100 people's a half. So those are the formulas. You'll see those later in chapter 4, I believe. Um, now let, let P go to zero and N go to infinity so that NP goes to some fixed number of lambda. All right, so let the parameters, one parameter go to zero, the other parameter go to infinity. So that NP just becomes uh, a limit of lambda greater than zero. Okay, so finite to a positive number. Um, then what's going to happen here? Then the expectation goes to the expected number, even though you're tossing lots and lots and lots of coins and going to infinity. Uh, the expected number of heads is lambda. And also the variance, what happens here? NP, well that's going to lambda, 1 minus P is going to 1 minus 0. So actually the expected value of the variance come off the same. So what you get is, and what we're thinking is maybe that uh, then um, we'll get a limiting distribution. We're hoping we're going to get a limiting distribution out of this. And it somehow could be interpreted as the number of rare events. Okay. Because P is very strong. So one way of modeling, uh, one way of where plus on distribution comes up, which is going to be the limit, is uh, we have uh, a sizable population and um, a rare disease. It only affects one in a thousand or one in ten thousand people. And then you look at the total number of cases in the community. That would be the number of rare events as the plus on that variable. We obtain a limiting distribution. Which I, well, or limiting frequency function, actually, which is the frequency function of a, a random variable. It is defined by um, probability mass function or frequency function. And you obtain P of K 
equal to e to the minus lambda, lambda to the k over k factorial. But now k takes it up to the possible value of zero. There might not be anybody sick in the community. Okay. Uh, one, two, and so on. Up to many, many people could be sick. Um, if the lambda was big enough, the expected number of cases was big. But at a million people, and the chances of uh, one over a thousand. So I'm not going to go through the derivation of how this actually goes today, I believe. Uh, it's done in the book on pages. Uh, what pages? 42 to 44, I think the bottom of page 42 to the 44, yeah. Bottom of page 42 to the top of page 44. It doesn't really take that long. It's got a big picture in there in between. <laughs> But it does take a little bit of work playing with um, the algebraic symbols to get the, uh, the limit to work. But I think what the easiest way to do it is to show you the Poisson probability and the binomial probability at the same time in, in this typical example. So we'll just do an example. Let's look at 2.1.5 example A. This is you'll see how this frequency function does actually give a very good approximation to the binomial probability. So we have, we're talking about the Poisson approximation to the binomial distribution. This example has to do with the number of occurrences of double sixes after rolling two fair six-sided dice 100 times. So we'll take the standard two cubic dice and roll them and roll them a hundred times. The pair of dice will roll a hundred times. And we'll look at the rare event is <laughs> boxcars. Double sixes. We used to call them boxcars <laughs> when we were kids. So is is the so what's the, what's the total number of occurrences of double sixes? What's the official distribution of the total number of occurrences of double sixes? Roll two fair dice 100 times. That x equal the number of occurrences of double sixes. What is the distribution of x? X. Sometimes I'll write this uh, tilde here to mean is distributed as. Binomial. With size parameter 100 and frequency parameter, what's the, what's the frequency parameter? What's the probability that I get a double 6? 1 over 36. There are six times six possibilities for uh, six times six observations possible on the two dice. What you think of is one of the dice being blue, the other one red. So you get a blue one and a red two, or a red one and a blue two. Those are distinct possibilities. Think of those as distinct possibilities likely. Okay. Each pair, one digit on the blue die, one digit on the red die, has the equal probability in, this, in the elementary probability space. There is 36 possibilities. So 136 would be each possible pair. But of course there's only one pair that has a red 6 and a blue 6. Right? There's only one pair. It doesn't occur twice. Okay, so it's 136 for the probability of double sixes. So that's the binomial or invertible size, parameter 100 and frequency parameter 136. So P is small, N is large, kind of, right? And so we're hoping that this Poisson approximation is kind of important. So I'm going to write lambda equals NP, 
which was 100 over 36 equals 2.78 or so. And that's going to be the parameter of a Poisson random variable. So I can think of x is approximately Poisson with parameter 2.78. Um, and what is done is the author takes this example and he compares the probability that you, the exact binomial probability versus the Poisson probability. This is on page 44. Um, of course, the random variables aren't the same because x can only go up to 100 in a binomial case, but x can keep going. You can go up to 200, 300, 400 in the Poisson case. All right. The probability is extremely tiny for both the binomial and the Poisson case. So within reason, the Poisson probability is given a very good approximation of the binomial probability as shown on page 44. Maybe we should pass the fork around so everybody can see it. Yeah, well, These guys are looking at you. Can I have one? Bob's book cut the binding off of it, scanned it, or stared it. That's one way to do it. Um, if, you, if you have bought a book, it's not, it wouldn't be legal to give you a copy if you didn't have a book, but if you bought a book, I'll give you the PDF. Yeah, <laughs> it's very funny. We got that on Sunday. Now, Russell, you hear me? Okay. Very nice. Um, <clears throat> so, how would we? How let's have a look and see how this approximation works. What is the probability, for example, that x is equal to five? Just pick one, for example, five. Well, the binomial probability comes out to 0.0858 and the Poisson approximation 0.0858. So let's just see. The exact binomial calculation would be 100 choose 5. Um, 136, the uh, double 6 is 5 times, so uh, you can double heads, I mean, double 6 occurs. Five times so probably 136, then of course for 30, probably 35, 36, it doesn't appear. So that would have to happen 95 times. And this comes out to 0 0.0858. I won't go ahead and calculate it. But if I was going to do a longhand, how it would be? How would it be? This would be 100 times 99 times 98 times 97 times 96 over 5 factorial. That's how the binomial coefficient comes out. And then I would have um, 1 over 36 times 36 times 36. I'm going to write 36 this way, 5 times. <laughs> OK, 5 factors, right? Why would I do it that way? And then I'm going to have 1 minus 136 to the 100 minus 5, I'm going to write it like that. Okay. This is to see the Poisson approximation. What's going to happen is I'm going to divide each of the 100 down to 96 by 36. Now, each of those factors, 100 down to 96, they're all about 100, up to you know, 3 or 4%, right? So I'm getting five factors of 2.78, roughly. So this is roughly. 2.78 to the fifth divided by 5 factorial. That takes care of all this stuff. All right, now what about this? What's well, 1 minus 136 to the 100? What you know is that the limit from calculus, you have the following limit. 1 minus um, a over m to the n. n goes to infinity equals e to the minus a. So what I'm going to do is, because 5 is kind of fixed and my n is 100, that's going to infinity. I'm just going to sort of, and then if I had 1 minus a over n, and of course 1 minus a over n to the fifth goes to 1 as n goes to infinity. So 
So I don't even worry about this little fiber. So I'm just going to kind of erase that. Okay. <laughs> I'm thinking this is going to infinity. The 100 is going to infinity. The 5 is going to fix a little number. Okay. And this is actually going to the 136. I'm thinking of is a over n going to, to zero. Where a is what? 136 would be. I'm going to let the n be 100. Okay. Is a 2.78 over 100. Right. So the A is 2.78. I know this is kind of quick. But remember the, the this 136. I have the one the probability here, the P, instead of the instead of instead of the uh, and I'm writing P as lambda over n. So this is the P, and I'm writing it as lambda over n. Okay. That's all I'm doing. So if A is the, I should put lambda here. That would be even nicer. Okay? That's really how we're applying it here. Put lambda here instead of A. Okay? So really applying it with, uh, so this is the 1 minus P, which is the 1 minus lambda over M to the N. So what I have here is a 1 minus lambda over N to the N minus a little K, which I'm thinking I'm throwing away. It's fixed. And letting that go to infinity, that goes to e to the minus lambda. So then this becomes e to, and this is e to the minus 2.78, okay? which also calculates out to 0 0.0858 approximately. Yeah. So the cosine is really an uh, estimation or an approximation? Well, a approximation is by another, but it's a, it's a distribution in its own right. In other words, I can add these and they add the 1. It is a distribution of right for it. Actually, this cross sum distribution comes up pretty naturally. Um, you can talk about a pulse on point process. If I wanted to just uh, uh, sort of put, I had the whole real line, and I wanted to just sort of scatter points at random on that line, on the whole line, what would I do? How would I do it? <laughs> well, it turns out that way you can think about it is, is, well, it turns out there does exist a way to do that, and what it would happen is that any interval, so you think of just a bunch of little X's falling down, sort of at random, but the spaces between they're not uniform, okay, it's kind of like sprinkled from infinity, okay, and uh, the number, if I fix any interval A, B, the number of little X's in there, of course, I could get more you know, x's per unit interval in one sprinkling and another depends how intense the sprinkling is. Okay, it rains, heavy rain or light rain, right? So, so the lambda could vary, but so given so there's a parameter, lambda. But now given an interval a b, the number of x's in there is a random number because uh, this is one sprinkling, but then I have to think of infinitely many real lines. Okay, points on it. But then the, now fix the interval, then you get a bunch of different possible. You can get two x's in that interval, or three x's in that interval, or one x in that interval, and so on. And the, the proportions are with the Poisson proportions. So that's called a point process. You can do it on a line, you can do it in the plane, you can do it in higher dimensions. I gave a reference in the notes to the subject of stochastic geometry. He really wants to study whether one of these point problems, if you, if you see something in nature, like where the, the uh, crows are nesting in the woodlands, are they at random in the woodland? Okay. Or, is, or are they doing something else? Um, you can sort of test to see whether that's a point process. Also a point process. So it's a very fascinating uh, subject. Um, so the number of, of uh, x's that fall in that interval is Poisson distributed. And there'll be independent Poisson variables for disjoint intervals. It's a Poisson process. We don't construct it here in this course. Uh, and usually talk a little bit about the construction in uh, stochastic modeling.
comments or questions about this? <laughs> All right, so there's a Poisson approximation, and so you have a Poisson random variable. Sometimes I think this derivation kind of keeps you keeps track of things. This is the lambda up here, the lambda comes to the base here, and the k is an exponent in this factorial. This is the k. It's five in this example. Uh, why do the probability is to one? You remember that good stuff? If I take so if I take e to the minus lambda lambda to the k over k factorial, is that sum to one if I go k goes from zero to infinity? This e to the minus lambda is just a constant. And also the very the k equals to zero case, by the way, is just this constant. If I put k equals to zero, lambda to the zero is one, zero factorial is one, so I just get e to the minus lambda. That's the probability that I get zero. Uh, double sixes, e to the minus lambda, which was just sticking stick here, e to the minus uh, 2.78 was 0 0.062. Probably x equal to 0 is approximately e to the minus 2.78 equals 0 0.062. So that would be probably again, 0 double sixes, no occurrence of box stars. But is this add up to one? Well, I can this because the summation is not okay. This is just a constant, so I can bring it to the other side and multiply. So this so it boils down to this k goes from zero to infinity, lambda to the k over k factorial equal to e to the lambda, and indeed it is because that's the Maclaurin series for e to the lambda. Remember that calc two. All right. Uh, there was another problem that I thought the Poisson approximation should be interesting for exercise 25. There actually are uh, errors in this book, even though it's the third edition. I don't know why this error is still in the book. The probability of being dealt a royal straight flush, flush, ace, king, queen, jack, and ten of the same suit in poker is about what? What's the actual probability of getting a royal straight flush? Anybody know? I looked on the internet to make sure my calculation was correct. <laughs> because the, it's not 10 to the minus 8, it's 10 to the minus 6. Okay. Um, the easy way to do that, there's only, there are only four royal flushes, right? And how many poker hands are there? 52 choose 5. 52 choose 5. So the probability of a royal straight flush is 4 or 52 choose 5. So this is chapter 2. Uh, number 25, if P equals 4 over 52 choose 5, equals 4 over, I can calculate that number, 259896, so this comes out to 1.539 times 10 to the minus 6. That's the probability of being dealt a uh, royal straight flush. I guess there are about 40 straight flushes, but only or 36 straight flushes. I don't know. That's how you count whether you let A be high and low in a straight flush. 40 if you let A be low, and I think 36 if you only let A be high or low. Um, okay. So that's just the error there. They say, suppose an avid poker player sees 100 hands a week, 52 weeks a year for 20 years. What's the probability that they will see no royal straight flushes ever? 20 years, 100 hands a week, 52 weeks a year. So, and in that case, it's 100 hands a week times 52 weeks times 20 years. Comes out to 104, zero, zero, zero. It's actually zero there, probably. Is, I'm sorry, this is only how many days was it? Yeah, so that's uh, about 10 to the fifth hands. Right? So NP is uh, 0.16. That's the expected 
number of Royal Street flushes they expect to see. And now it's 20 years. Okay, not too many. All right, not even one average on average. Okay, in other words, if you took all these different average poker players and averaged all their numbers, you come up to 0.16. So the probability of seeing zero, probably x equal to zero, is approximately even the minus. 0.160 equals uh, 0.8521. 85% chance of not seeing any. All right, you might say at this point, well, why even bother with the binomial distribution? Just use plus on for everything. <laughs> well, it might not work too well if n was 3 and p is, you know, a half. It just doesn't work for everything. It only works for small people, so don't try to apply it when p is 0.9. You, you have to rearrange your thought process and switch to p equals 0.1 by using the, uh, the symmetry. Uh, so you have to formulate the problem in order to get a small p, otherwise it certainly isn't going to work. Right. So don't apply with a large p. <laughs> Let's go on to uh, continuous random variables. So I hand up the new notes. And uh, let's see. A little bit behind in the notes, but I guess that happens at the beginning of the course. Uh, let's see where I can go with this. So I'm going to go into section 2.2 here. Talk <coughs> like a little bit about, I already talked a little bit about a cumulative distribution function, but I notice the author really gets into it here. So I need to talk a little bit more about it. Um, what is a continuous random variable? variable? Okay. I think the, the standard example of a continuous random variable is pick a number random between 0 and 1. What do I mean a number random? I mean a, a real number. So I think of something with infinitely many digits. So you give me infinitely many digits. Is continuous. 
as a function of x. But that's not the definition we're going to take in this course because that's too general. It takes into account too many random variables. Uh, it's a little bit too general. What we really want to talk about is something random variables that are absolutely continuous. So never at this level of the probability does, does, the, does the office even mention that fact, but I'm mentioning it here. <laughs> I like the definition of continuous random variable just say that this is a continuous function. That's a nice definition. And that's the correct definition. Okay. In the general case. Um, uh, so for for example, the probability that x, so in particular, the probability that x is equal to a value, a little x, would be uh, the probability that x is less than or equal to x minus the probability that x is less than x. Which remember how I got this it was just f of x. This is just the number f of x. And remember last time I talked about this being a limit as uh, t goes to x from the left of f of t. All right, so the probability that x is just less than x was the limit. And that limit always exists. The left-hand limit of the cumulative distribution function exists. And of course, if the function is continuous, this is simply the f of x minus f of x by continuity. Because there are no jumps if the function is continuous, if the CDF is continuous. Basically, a CDF roughly can only, it can only be discontinuous with a jump somehow. Okay. Well, that's a fact. Yeah. In other words, that's a fact again. Uh, it always is continuous from the right. I mentioned that. It has a lot of limits. So the only way it can be discontinuous is if these two numbers aren't the same. Because um, the continuity corresponds to left limit equals right limit equals the value of the function. That's the definition of calculus. So, as long as the left, uh, as long as it is continuous, then the left limit is equal to the maximum. So, this is this is this is uh, outlawed in the continuous case. Okay, so you have a continuous function, but now we're also going to assume that it's uh, practically differential. So what we're really going to do is we're going to introduce, we're going to assume now that there exists a density. A density function. Little f of x. That is piecewise continuous. What does that mean? I always have to figure it out. It means it doesn't have to be continuous because you can put another adjective in there. <laughs> okay. But it's continuous on intervals. So that means you could it'd be continuous for a while and then it could jump and be continuous for another while and then it could jump and be continuous for another while like that. Okay. And such that uh, such that the cumulative distribution function is written as the integral from minus infinity to x of x to t dt. As long as it's piecewise continuous, you can make sense of the Riemann integral. You can all uh, calculus one integral. Um, because this little uh, jump here is not going to affect uh, the Riemann integral. Okay. Uh, piecewise continuous, maybe I should say compound it. Throw that in the Riemann integral, such that this is true. Uh, function f of x, I'll put it non negative here. If you substitute the bottom, such that this, what does bottom mean? It can't go to infinity. Okay. Okay. Um, so, in particular, this is for all x. So, in particular, uh, if I take little x go to infinity, I should have minus infinity to infinity of f of t t is equal to 1. So the total, so it's a non-negative function. 
usually not negative, so that the the CDF will continue to increase. All right, and I need the total probability to be one. So that's what the density function is initially. Where usually people say, "Well, you mean how it works?" <laughs> it, uh, what it does is that um, it gives you that gives the density gives probabilities, probably the x between a and b, by integrating, let's see, how would it do this? This would, this would be capital F of, this would be the same as probability that a is less than capital X less than or equal to b, I believe, in this case, because this is, under these conditions, capital Fx is continuous, has a continuous function. So, I think that uh, it's easy to show that this is a continuous function of x. It's differential even, but not where at little f maybe it's discontinuous, but it's always continuous, at least it's a nice function. So this is true, which is capital F of B minus capital F of A. So sometimes people get confused with the capital F and the little f in the first course. When you give the capital F, you can find probability just by differencing with a distribution function. You don't have to do any integration or anything. All right? Because these are all the integrals already. Capital F of X is all the integrals of the density. So you get this, and then this is integral A of B, F of T, D, D. So you can either include the endpoint or not include the endpoint. It won't make any difference. I could have included the left hand endpoint as well. Because points have zero probability of continuous space. So this in case of the existence of the density function. So here was a non-negative function. Okay. So the integral on the area under the curve, let's make it zero, whatever. So the area under the curve has to be one. Okay. This is a little f. Okay? And it has to be a non-negative function. That's what a density is. Very simple. It gives you probability by area. Now, what's the interpretation of the um, density function? Well, maybe we give a quick example first before we do the interpretation. Let's look at these pictures that are most standard density functions you're going to encounter. We have these two examples right off the bat. One would be the density function corresponding to that random pick of a unit of a number between 0 and 1. Uh, think about it. If I wanted to pick a number random between 0 and 1, and, it would, and so I would want a continuous random variable, now should I prefer any one zone in the interval to any other zone in the interval? Presumably not. So that means my, we like part of the idea that the density would be constant. If I had a constant on the unit interval, it would be a density. What would that constant have to be? One. It would have to be one. So the area would be one under the curve. So this is f. It's simply going to be f of x equals one. Zero less or equal to x less or equal to one is zero else. And that's a, that's a probability density function. So it's continuous, the integral is not negative, the integral on the whole line is 1. Those three properties are not negative, which is usually obvious from whatever picture you've got or whatever formula. Piecewise is continuous. Also, obvious here. So let's see, what's the distribution function corresponding? What's capital on the right? Y equals X, yeah, uh, in the important region. Okay, so it would be uh, integral minus infinity to X of F of T dt, which is simply going to be integral of zero as long as X is less than zero, okay? And then when X is between zero and one, you integrate T, excuse me, you integrate one dt, right? So it's integral zero to X, 
1 dp equals x breaks between 0 and 1, because I only, from minus infinity to 0, I get 0 contribution to integral. If I'm integrating 0 dt up until, say, minus infinity less than x less than or equal less than 0, or 1 less than x less than infinity. I'll just write it that way. Okay. So if the function is 0 to the left here, the density is 0 to the left of 0 is 0 to the right of 1. So when I integrate from minus infinity to x of the density, I get 0 contribution from the interval of minus infinity to 0. I'll cut this interval minus infinity to x at 0. So then I'm going to get a contribution from 0 to x, 1 dt equals x. And that's x bigger than at x equal to 1, this becomes 1. And I don't get any more contribution. The maximum value of this on the interval 0 to 1 would be 1. I would go up to 1 and I would stay there. So I get this picture. So you see that the cumulative distribution function is differentiable everywhere except at 0 and 1. The function is not really of density. What's another example? Uh, another simple example. And in the next, uh, let's see, somewhere along the line. Yeah, the author uh, introduces a general class of uniform random variables, which is simply a density constant on an interval. So how would you generalize that? So uniform random variable x on the interval a, b. I'll just write it to open interval a, b. You can call it the closed interval a, b if you like. And the endpoints never get touched anyway. Then that's f of x equals 1 over the length of the interval. a less than x less than b and 0 counts. So that's just, again, a, a constant density function over an interval. Uh, what's the exponent? I'll see, let's have another example. Another example. Uh, f of x equals e to the minus x. x greater than 0, 0 else. Greater than or equal to 0 for life. To a matter of taste, really, right? Half closed interval, or closed interval versus open intervals. Out of density? I need to, it's not a negative. It's not continuous. I need to check the integral is 1. So, okay. So I simply integrate e to the minus x. Uh, that becomes integral e to the minus x from 0 to infinity. dx minus e to the minus x from the antiderivative of 0 to infinity. <coughs> I always teach my doctorate students, whenever there's a minus on there, especially the limits on the definite integral, it's, it's the last minus sign. Okay, so I can give the minus 0 minus e to the minus infinity equals 1 minus 0. The cumulative distribution function, what does it look like? Capital F of x. Equals, I have to use the substitution variable, minus infinity of x, f of t dt. That will be 0 again, x is less than 0, because I don't have anything to integrate. The density, the density was 0 on the left, and then it goes to e to the minus x here, it's f. Okay? Looks like e to the minus x where x greater than 0, 0. So I, Okay, what is the cumulative distribution function? So, um, it's a percentage of people whose characteristic is less than or equal to x, right? But uh, these people have a characteristic that's all positive. The characteristic is a positive number, okay? So, 
alpha X is positive or not negative here, right? So the percentage of people who have characteristic less than or equal to negative one is zero. The percentage of people who have characteristic that less than negative one half is zero, etc. Okay? So this the the cube distribution function is zero. And then we look at the percentage of people whose characteristic is less than or equal to one or something. And then now it's the area under the curve from zero to one. So zero to X be the minus T D T when X is positive. Okay, or greater or equal to zero. And what does that integral come out to be? Well, that you can do exactly like this one over here. Oh, now the limits are uh, zero at x. So now that x comes down here and the zero up there. E to the minus zero minus e to the minus x. Just one minus e to the minus x. That's the cumulative distribution function. We graph it. It looks therefore like this. With a limit, limiting value of one as x goes to infinity. Thanks. Increases obviously by the very definition. Okay. So how can you interpret little f of x? One way to say is the instantaneous rate at which probability accrues. Because it's the height and then you take the width, okay, and you get a little bit more probability. Add in the capital F. So the instantaneous rate at which probability accrues for this cumulative distribution function. Because remember you're so you're adding to the cumulative distribution function. When you take a little bit higher x, there's more people, okay, that have characteristic less than or equal. X. So it's a higher probability. Probability accrues than the cumulative distribution function. Um, and also, how would I relate it to the uh, frequency function? Just we're out of time. Uh, how would I relate it to the frequency function? somehow play the role of the frequency function, or what does it do? Because the author starts that section saying, well, this plays the role of the frequency function. In what, in what sense? Because actually, not quite. F, little, capital F is probability. Little f is not probability. Some of you may, what is little f? Little f has units. Yeah, it has, it has units of x to the minus 1. X is in feet, okay? Your height in feet, okay? The density is in units of feet to the minus one. So it actually has units. Probability is unit lips, but feet is not. Okay, <laughs> feet is feet, all right? So um, it's. Delta over 2 to x plus, it's always equal to this. 
f of t dt. But then, if x is a continuity point of little f, then I can write this as approximately little f of x, because the values of f of t are all about little f of x by continuity of little f. f of x times delta. Okay. So, another way to write this is that um, is the interpretation of density then? Probably that x is in an infinitesimal interval x to x plus dx. I like to use the dx, right? That is approximately f of x dx. So just forget about this condition of being in a continuity pattern. This, this is how you're supposed to think of the density. The probably that x is near little x is f of x dx, where dx is the nearness, the infinitesimal amount which is actually a physical positive quantity in practice, right? if you put the delta in it, right? So the dx is the same as the delta. It's all different deltas that are small. Okay. So <clears throat> that looks like that's a probability. This is, a, this is obviously a probability. Probably the x is between x and, you know, between 1 and 1 point, or let's see, between 0.5 and 0.501, right? Probably the x is between is in the interval 0.5 to 0.501. I'll add 1,000 to my delta, where dx is 1,000. Okay? This would be about f of x, my f of x, which is 1 in the uniform case. Let's say, oh, well, let's, let's put f of x, so consider both cases, times 0.001. Okay? Now, in the case of the graph density, you get a different graph right, of 0.5. Okay. So if I have the uniform density, I put in f of 0.5 equals to 1. If I've got this density, I put in f of 0.5 equals e to the minus 0.5. Okay. So that's the probability. f of x dx plays the role of the p of k. So I get a probability, in both cases I get a probability by something. Right, you get any probability that x between a and b is, 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 is f of x dx. You still continue sum of probabilities. Right, this is the probability. The dx you really need in this formula. Okay? This is my point. Okay, you continue sum of these probabilities. In a discrete case, this is a sum, a discrete sum. K okay, goes from a to b. All good old review. <laughs> it may not seem like review. So uh, let's see. Next, okay. So we have the weekend now, and um, you actually should be in pretty good shape. So they talk about human distribution a lot to do uh, all these all these problems. Um, the only one that I think would be you might have some trouble with is the exponential variable. But you can look that up. You've seen it before.